The Siege of Mecca by Yaroslav Trofimov Narrated by Todd McLaren Copyright 2007 by Yaroslav Trofimov This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Yaroslav Trofimov and the William Morris Agency and was produced in the year 2007 by Tantor Media Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Introduction The holy city of Mecca looked deceptively calm as the first dawn of the new century started to break behind craggy mountains. Splashing his face with cold water, the Grand Mosque's bearded imam fastened a beige-hued cloak over his shoulder and muttered praises to the Lord. The time to lead the morning's first prayer was minutes away. Under his window, the mosque's floodlit courtyard was filling up quickly. The Hajj pilgrimage season when this stadium-sized enclosure was traversed by more than a million worshippers, had already ended. Yet Mecca remained jam-packed with the faithful. Many of them had spent the night inside Islam's holiest shrine, curling up on wool carpets in the Grand Mosque's multi-story labyrinth of nearly a thousand rooms. As usual, these worshippers camped along with their bundles, mattresses, and suitcases that nobody had bothered to check. Following custom, Many hauled in wooden coffins, hoping that the imam would bestow on decomposing relatives inside the precious blessings that can only be received in such a sacred precinct. Today, some of these coffins contained an unusual cargo. Kalishnikov assault rifles, Belgian-made FNFAL guns, bullet belts, and an assortment of pistols. The men who had smuggled this arsenal into the mosque sought an ambitious goal— to reverse the flow of world history, sparking a global war that would finally lead to Islam's total victory and to a destruction of arrogant Christians and Jews. The date was the first of Muharram of Islam's year 1400, which in calendars kept by infidel Westerners corresponded to November 20th, 1979. For the natives of Mecca, a city that lives off the flood of humanity that has coursed through its shrine since time immemorial, This Tuesday morning promised a particularly joyful occasion. New Year's Day is when, according to tradition, the Meccans make a pilgrimage of their own to the Grand Mosque. In darkness, thousands trek to the outskirts of the city, shedding everyday clothes after a shower, and returning in the pilgrims' snow-white ikram outfits, two towel-like garments that symbolize purity and leave men's right shoulders exposed. Mixing in with the locals were as many as 100,000 visitors from all over the world, Pakistanis and Indonesians, Moroccans and Yemenis, Nigerians and Turks. Some were stragglers left behind after the Hajj, entrepreneurial pilgrims who, year after year, try to offset the cost of their passage by reselling in Mecca's bazaars exotic wares from their remote homelands. Others had arrived in Mecca just to witness the turn of the century a -a once-in-a-lifetime event. Hidden in this human sea were hundreds of grim-faced rebels, many of them sporting red checkered headdresses. Some had been inside the mosque for days, reconnoitering its maze of corridors and passageways. Others were bussed in during the night by a friendly religious academy. Yet others drove their own cars to Mecca this morning, arriving at the last minute and accompanied by children and wives to allay guard suspicions. Most of these conspirators were Saudis of Bedouin stock, though their ranks also brimmed with foreigners, if such a word had a meaning for men who believed in the single citizenship of Islam. They even included African-American converts, inspired by a new faith and hardened by race riots half a world away. The color of the cloudless sky just started to turn from grayish to pink when the dawn ritual began, as it does that time of the year, at 5.18 a.m. La ilaha illa Allah, the deep-voiced prayer call rang from new loudspeakers affixed atop the mosque's seven towering minarets. There is no God but Allah. Barefoot, worshippers knelt in the grand mosque's marble-paved courtyard. Clearing his throat, the imam picked up the microphone and read out the blessings. On his cue, the faithful prostrated themselves on the ground, in a vast succession of concentric circles that radiated from the Kaaba, an ancient cube draped in black silk embroidered with gold that looms in the center of the enclosure. Then, 
Just as the imam concluded the prayer with wishes of peace, gunshots rang out. The crackling sound reverberated in the courtyard as in an echo chamber. Stunned worshippers spotted a young man, a rifle in his hands, walking briskly toward the Kaaba. Another shot sent into the air flocks of panic pigeons that usually graze on the plaza outside the Grand Mosque. Rumors quickly swirled through the crowd. What could all this be? What was all that noise? Maybe there is an innocuous explanation, one man opined. Maybe the gunmen were bodyguards for some senior prince, or even the Saudi monarch, King Khaled himself. Maybe the gunfire was just some peculiar Saudi way to celebrate the New Year. More knowledgeable worshippers shuddered. Firing a weapon in the Grand Mosque, they knew, was a grave sin. They couldn't recall the last time such a sacrilege had occurred. Pilgrims watched with angst as more and more gunmen closed in on the Kaaba, carrying weapons that had been extracted from uncrated coffins. The Grand Mosque's own police force, armed with nothing more threatening than sticks for beating misbehaving foreign pilgrims, melted away once two guards who attempted resistance fell dead by the gates. Amid this commotion, the rebels' leader, Juhayman al Otebi emerged from the depths of the mosque. A 43-year-old Bedouin preacher with magnetic black eyes, sensual lips, and shoulder-length hair that seamlessly blended into a black curly beard, Juhayman conveyed a sense of immediate authority, despite his slender stature. Emulating a piety first displayed by Prophet Muhammad himself, he wore a traditional Saudi white robe that was cut short at mid-calf to signal the rejection of material goods. Unlike his fellow gunmen, he was bareheaded, with only a thin green hairband keeping his unruly locks in check. Flanked by three militants armed with rifles, pistols, and daggers, Juhayman started to elbow his way across the courtyard toward the sacred Kaaba and the Grand Mosque's Imam. The cleric, who had just turned his face away from the Kaaba and toward the distressing tumult among the believers, noticed that he was standing right next to a coffin. This one contained a real cadaver. The dead child's relatives, oblivious to the mounting upheaval, were imploring the imam to bless the tiny corpse. As the cleric obliged, reciting the sacred lines, recognition flickered on his face. He realized in these moments that Juhayman and some of the other gunmen, who now got disconcertingly close, had attended his lectures on Islam here in Mecca. This feeling turned to horror seconds later as Juhayman unceremoniously pushed the cleric aside and seized the microphone. When the imam tried to wrestle back the mic, one of the intruders raised a sharp curved dagger and screamed at the top of his lungs, ready to stab. A fright swept the crowd. Picking up shoes, thousands rushed toward the enclosure's gates, only to find all fifty-one of them chained shut. Ragged-looking gunmen, muzzles staring into the crowd, barred all exits. Unsure of how to behave, some worshippers started chanting, Allahu Akbar, God is greatest, the Muslims' invocation of faith in a moment of adversity. The gunmen unexpectedly joined in this chorus, and it became louder and louder, spreading through the packed mosque until it turned into a deafening roar. When this chanting subsided, Juhayman barked into the microphone a series of clipped military commands. Following his instructions, Scores of his well-trained followers dispersed throughout the compound, setting up machine-gun nests atop the shrine's seven minarets. Trapped pilgrims were gang-pressed into aiding the rebels. Some had to roll up the thousands of heavy carpets inside the courtyard and prop them up against the chain gates. The fittest were forced at gunpoint to climb the steep staircases to the tops of the minarets, carrying water and crates of ammunition. The takeover of Islam's Holy of Holies was swift and complete. At their 89 meters, 292 feet, of height, the mosque's minarets overlooked much of downtown Mecca, providing rebel snipers with a vast field of fire. Trigger fingers caressed the cold metal. They scanned neighboring streets for potential foes. If you see a government soldier who wants to raise his hand against you, have no pity and shoot him because he wants to kill you, Juhayman instructed these snipers in his guttural desert accent. Do not hesitate. Under the minarets, even Saudis, 
proficient in the local dialect, had a hard time understanding what was going on. The crying of women, the coughing of elders, and the shuffling of bare feet filled the Grand Mosque's courtyard with an anxious hum. Many foreigners among the tens of thousands of hostages spoke no Arabic at all and stood transfixed in the turmoil, asking better-educated countrymen for explanation in a multitude of tongues. The conspirators were prepared for linguistic problems and wanted to be comprehended. Soon they grouped Pakistani and Indian pilgrims on one side of the mosque, with a Pakistani-born rebel interpreting the announcements in Urdu to bewildered compatriots. A cluster of Africans was provided with a speaker of English. "'Sit down, sit down and listen,' Juhayman's gunman yelled, rifle-butting those pilgrims who dared to disobey. As cowed worshippers finally settled in fearful attention, the mysterious group indicated that its authority now extended well beyond the Grand Mosque to Saudi Arabia's commercial capital and to the second of the country's two holy cities. "'Mecca, Medina, and Jeddah are now in our hands.' the rebels declared through the shrine's public address system, so powerful that their words could be heard throughout central Mecca. Then Juhayman handed the microphone to an aide better versed in classical Arabic speech. It was high time to explain the purpose of this daring venture. For the next hour, the Grand Mosque's loudspeakers relayed the uprising's shocking message to the world's one billion Muslims, announcing that an ancient prophecy had been fulfilled at last, and that the hour of final reckoning was being struck. By the time this speech, occasionally interspersed with gunshots, was over, and the loudspeakers fell silent, panic infected the whole of central Mecca. Even waiters at the outdoor cafes near the mosque had all run away. Thus began a drawn-out battle that would drench Mecca in blood, marking a watershed moment for the Islamic world and the West. Within hours, this outrage would prompt a global diplomatic crisis, spreading death and destruction thousands of miles away. American pilots and European commandos would all have to be involved in restoring the shrines of Islam to the House of Saud. Soon, American lives would be lost, and America would find itself more isolated than ever in the increasingly hostile Muslim universe. The consequences of this forgotten crisis which remains blotted out of history books in Saudi Arabia and many other Muslim lands, lasts to this day. In tackling Juhayman's brazen attack on its holiest shrine, the Saudi government showed sickening arrogance, cruel incompetence, and bewildering disregard for the truth. The royal family's image was sullied forever. Many Muslims in Saudi Arabia and beyond, including the young Osama bin Laden, were so repulsed by the carnage in Mecca that their loyalty started to fracture. In the following years, they drifted toward open opposition to the House of Saud and its American backers. The fiery ideology that inspired Juhayman's men to murder and mayhem in Islam's Holy of Holies mutated with time into increasingly more vicious strains, culminating in Al-Qaeda's death cult. By a coincidence of global events, it is precisely this ideology that American policymakers and the House of Saud, found right after the crisis in Mecca to be of great value on the Cold War battlefronts. Instead of being suppressed, Juhayman's brutal band of Islam was encouraged and nurtured as it metastasized across the planet since 1979. Today, hordes of his spiritual heirs are busy blowing up airplanes, tourist hotels, and commuter trains on four continents, self-satisfied smiles of true believers curling their lips. The significance of the Mecca uprising was missed at the time even by the most sharp-eyed observers. Too many other threats preoccupied the West. The seizure of the Grand Mosque, the first large-scale operation by an international jihadi movement in modern times, was shrugged off as a local incident, an anachronistic throwback to Arabia's Bedouin past. But with the benefit of hindsight, it is painfully clear. The countdown to September 11th, to the terrorist bombings in London and Madrid, and to the grisly Islamist violence ravaging Afghanistan and Iraq, all began on that warm November morning, in the shade of the Kaaba. Chapter 1 The territory that Juhayman and his men occupied in Mecca was literally the center of the Muslim universe. It is toward the Kaaba, the black-clothed cubicle building, also known as House of God, in the Grand Mosque's courtyard, that Muslims worldwide turn in prayer 
five times a day. Every Muslim who can afford it must visit the Kaaba during the annual Hajj at least once in a lifetime, donning the two-piece ihram and performing seven counterclockwise circumambulations around the building. A swirl of women and men circles the Kaaba day and night, as constant until Juhayman's interruption as the movement of planets around the sun. According to the Prophet Muhammad, a prayer at this sacred spot, the axis between heaven and earth, is worth a hundred thousand prayers elsewhere. Even in death, Muslims are buried with their faces turned toward the Kaaba. This simple stone structure, measuring some sixteen meters in height and twelve meters in length, about fifty-two and a half feet by forty feet, is believed by Muslims to have been built many millennia ago by Prophet Ibrahim, the patriarch of Arabs and Jews, who is known as Abraham in the Bible. In Christian and Jewish tradition, Abraham's rightful heir is Isaac, the forefather of Jews, born to Abraham's wife, Sarah. For Muslims, Ibrahim's legacy instead went to Ishmael, the forefather of Arabs and the son of the Egyptian slave girl, Hagar. According to Muslim canon, Ibrahim had left Hagar and the infant Ishmael all alone in Mecca, then just a barren desert valley, without a well in sight, carpeted by fine sand among occasional shrubs and sharp-edged rock outcroppings. The anguished mother, seeing baby Ishmael dying of thirst, ran seven times between the two hills of Marwa and Safa, searching for water. As she nearly abandoned hope, a spring miraculously burst out from the ground. This was the holy source of Zamzam, adjacent to the Kaaba and still supplying the taps in the Grand Mosque. Its water, which is said to be streaming directly from paradise, is avidly collected in bottles and plastic containers by pilgrims and then transported all over the world as a precious cure against bad luck and disease. While in Mecca, worshippers reenact Hagar's seven races between Marwar and Safa. The path between the two rocky hills is now paved and sheltered by a covered gallery attached to the Grand Mosque's outer perimeter. Ishmael and his mother are said to be buried next to the Kaaba in a low C-shaped wall known as Rukun. A boulder preserved beneath a golden dome nearby is marked with what is believed to be the impression of Ibrahim's feet. According to tradition, Ibrahim stood on that spot while erecting the Kaaba atop the foundation of an even more ancient house that had been constructed on God's own direction by Adam and modeled by the first human on a building he had admired before his expulsion from Eden. The Kaaba, from its very beginning, was meant to be a shrine, a sanctuary where prayers could be offered in absolute safety. There is little independent knowledge of the site's history, other than that over the centuries the current structure has been repeatedly destroyed by cataclysms and floods, just to be rebuilt on the very same spot. Long a place where Arabian tribesmen worshipped idols, the building displays in its southeastern corner a polished black stone, probably of meteoric origin and credited with magical powers. The sacred black stone is encased in a broad silver band. It is said to have been originally white and to have turned black after absorbing the sins of millions of worshippers who touch and kiss it every year. A Meccan tribe, the Quraysh, had been guarding the Kaaba and its idols for centuries before the advent of Islam, earning a comfortable living from the pilgrim trade. This arrangement almost ended in 570 CE when the shrine's growing prominence attracted the wrath of a Christian Abyssinian viceroy of Yemen named Abraha. Riding a fearsome elephant into battle, Abraha, who wanted Arabian pilgrims to visit his newly built church instead, approached the city and announced his plans to raise the Kaaba to the ground. Once the terrified Meccans withdrew into nearby hills, Placing the Kaaba's safety into God's hands, flocks of strange birds appeared in the sky and proceeded to shower the Abyssinians with pea-sized clay stones. This bombardment infected Abraha and his army of the elephant with deadly disease, causing his heart to burst and his fingers to fall off one by one. The unlucky Christian invaders, the Muslim scripture says, were rendered like straw eaten up. Explaining this narrative, an Arab chronicler suggests that the house of God had been saved thanks to a provident outbreak of smallpox and measles. The very same year, a boy named Muhammad was born to a Quraysh subclan in the city. Once he grew into adulthood, 
the Muslim canon holds, Muhammad started receiving from Angel Gabriel the final word of God, the Quran, or literally, recitation, which corrected mistaken beliefs of Christians and Jews. Mandating obedience to a single God, this religion of Islam also declared the local custom of idol worship a mortal sin. Prophet Muhammad's demands to purge the Kaaba of totems and fetishes earned him the enmity of his hometown. In 622, he had to flee north to a city now known as Medina, establishing there the world's first community that lived under the new laws of Islam. It was this migration, known as Hijra in Arabic, that marked the first year of Islam's 354-day lunar calendar. Prophet Muhammad returned home at the head of a victorious Islamic army eight years later, throwing the despised idols out of the Kaaba and decreeing that infidels henceforth should be barred from setting foot in Medina and Mecca, the two holy cities where the Quran had been revealed. This injunction is still in effect. Saudi government checkpoints ring approaches to Mecca, and travelers of any non-Muslim religion, which is marked in their IDs, have to bypass the city on a circuitous deviation signposted as the Non-Muslims Road. Mecca, which flourished as an unrivaled pilgrimage center once Islam conquered lands from Indonesia to Spain, has remained firmly under Muslim control ever since. The closest it came to falling into infidel hands since the elephant-riding Abraha was in 1182, when crusader prince Renaud de Chantillon led a marauding expedition down the Red Sea from his fortress in what is now Jordan. Attempting to sack the two holy cities of Islam, he captured pilgrim caravans heading to Mecca and sent his marines inland to Medina with a mission to steal Muhammad's body, which is buried there. But de Chantillon's men never reached the shrines. A few years later, Salahedin, the Muslim conqueror of Jerusalem, punished the crusader prince's insolence by severing his head. The only people who actually managed to seize by force and desecrate Mecca's Grand Mosque before Juhayman's uprising of 1979 were fellow Muslims. In the year 929, members of Islam's fringe Karmatian sect pillaged the Kaaba and purloined the magic black stone. They took it to their tribal homeland in eastern Arabia, near the city of Katif, in a mistaken belief that such usurpation would generate a profitable influx of pilgrims. This tourism promotion scheme never worked. Twenty years later, the Kamartians gave up and returned the stone, damaged in the process, to its rightful place. In following centuries, Bedouin nomads who roamed the vast emptiness of Arabia, living off camel herding and predatory raids on rival tribes, relapsed into many of the same pagan practices so roundly condemned by Prophet Muhammad. While nominally Muslim, they worshipped again the graves of ancestors, holy rocks, and old trees. Then, in the mid-1700s, they encountered a fiery new breed of preachers. Dubbed Wahhabis by their numerous foes, these bearded clerics followed the creed of a man of religion named Muhammad ibn Abdel Wahhab. His teachings were not complicated. They demanded a return to a pure and harsh faith of the kind once practiced by Prophet Muhammad and his early companions. Outraged by the loose ways and European influences that had begun to corrupt the lands of Islam, Ibn Abdel Wahhab rejected the vast wealth of culture and sophisticated philosophy accumulated by the Muslim world in the previous thousand years as a harmful and heretical innovation, bidah. With its stress on simplicity and rejection of luxuries such as tobacco, gold jewelry for men, silk clothes, music, and dancing, the Wahhabi idea stoked Bedouin pride. After all, it proclaimed the superiority of their simple desert customs over the confusing ways of uppity townsfolk in cities like Mecca or Basra. To Wahhabi preachers spreading this new gospel, a holy war of jihad was the only possible attitude toward Christian powers that already were encroaching upon Muslim lands. Miscreant Shiites, adepts of the smaller of the two main branches of Islam that dominates Iran, South Iraq, and parts of Arabia's Gulf Coast, were also treated as legitimate prey, subject to conversion or extermination. Like most Muslims worldwide, Wahhabis belonged to the Sunni community that parted ways with the Shiites in the early days of Islam because of a succession dispute. After Prophet Muhammad's death in 632, 
the future Shiites demanded that leadership of the Muslim world be inherited by his son-in-law, Ali, and then by the Prophet's grandsons, Hassan and Hussein. The future Sunnis refused, installing in power other companions of the Prophet. Resulting wars caused a theological schism that lasts until this day. Shiite towns on the edges of the Arabian desert weren't the only quarry of Wahhabi raiders. Fellow Sunnis, too, were considered infidels in disguise, unless they embraced all the rigors of the only true faith, precisely as interpreted by Ibn Abd al-Wahhab. This fiery ideology provided a powerful economic incentive for joining the new sect. For Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's Bedouin converts, pillaging non-Wahhabi neighbors stopped being simple banditry, it turned into doing God's work. Ibn Abd al-Wahhab's early supporter was a tribal sheikh named Muhammad al-Sa'd, from the Central Arabian Highlands of the Nejd. The combination of al-Sa'd's military prowess and Wahhabi religious zeal quickly turned this new Saudi state into a major power in the Arabian Peninsula. Muhammad al-Sa'd's heirs even dared to challenge the mighty Ottoman Empire, whose Istanbul-based sultan held the title of Caliph of all Muslims and considered himself Arabia's rightful suzerain. In the year 1802, a terrifying force of al-Sa'd's camel-riding Wahhabi warriors emerged from the desert outside the city of Karbala in Ottoman-ruled Iraq. A center of Shiite learning and pilgrimage centered around the gold-domed tomb of Prophet Muhammad's grandson Hussein. Karbala was a city of incredible treasures that had been ferried there over the centuries by the faithful from Persia, India, and beyond. It was also poorly defended. As they set Karbala's mosques and academies ablaze, the Wahhabi invaders showed no mercy for the despised Shiites. According to a contemporary account, some 4,000 of Karbala's citizens perished. The Bedouin invaders had a particular predilection for disemboweling pregnant women and leaving their fetuses atop bleeding corpses. 4,000 camels were reportedly needed to carry the plunder back into the barren badlands of the Nejd. The following year, it was Mecca's turn. Well aware of the wholesale slaughter in Karbala, the Meccans chose to surrender without a fight. The Wahhabis promptly forbade smoking of tobacco, burning all pipes on a main square. In line with their distaste for opulent graves, they also destroyed the mausoleums that had been built over the tombs of prominent Muslims. When they seized Medina shortly thereafter, the Wahhabis engaged in another round of grave smashing going as far as desecrating Prophet Muhammad's own tomb. It wasn't until 1813 that an Egyptian expeditionary corps recaptured Mecca from al-Sa'd's Wahhabis on behalf of the Ottoman Empire. It took the Egyptians another five years of war to seize and raise al-Sa'd's capital city of Diraiya, just outside what is now Riyadh. The defeated Saudi monarch was brought in a cage to Istanbul and beheaded in front of St. Sophia amid fireworks and a public celebration. When the 20th century began, few people outside Arabia remembered al-Sad. The family's elders lived as exiles in Kuwait, their ancestral lands of the Nejd governed by rival tribes. In the Hejaz coastal region that encompasses Mecca and Medina, the Hashemite dynasty that would later provide the kings of Jordan and Iraq was firmly in control. Then, in January 1902, a young al-Sa'd chieftain named Abdelaziz led a small raiding party to the desert near Riyadh. The raiders numbered only six dozen men. At night, they climbed above an unrepaired wall and found refuge in an old supporter's home. Patiently, they waited for the local governor to emerge from Riyadh's mud fort and head for the morning prayer in the town mosque. Once the fort's heavy wooden gate finally opened and the governor stepped outside, Abdelaziz's men struck without pity. A shot fired by Abdelaziz himself felled the governor. A spear launched at the same time by another raider lodged in the gate, its tip still visible there. The hapless garrison was put to the sword. Riyadh, where many townsfolk entertained fond memories about al-Sa'd's past glory and about the wealth once brought by raiding neighborhood lands, was under Saudi rule again. A new empire began. News of al-Sa'd's stunning victory in Riyadh spread through Arabia like wildfire. In skirmish after skirmish, Abdelaziz defeated nearby tribes and gained authority across much of the Nejd, 
just as his ancestors had done more than a century earlier. Conquered tribes were forced to adopt the Wahhabi way of Islam, with bearded instructors making sure that the five daily prayer times were strictly observed and that no music or smoking occurred in al-Sad's new domains. Al-Sad's proselytizers deeply resented the very appellation of Wahhabis, a label that suggested they didn't quite belong to mainstream Sunni Islam. Far from considering themselves a separate sect, the Wahhabi clerics insisted that they merely enforced strict obedience of the Tawheed, uncompromising monotheism, that had been commanded by Prophet Muhammad since the dawn of Islam. There was one problem to overcome. Rigorous discharge of Islamic rituals requires ablutions before prayers and is therefore ill-suited for a nomadic lifestyle in the waterless desert. Al-Sad and the Wahhabi clergy came up with a piece of social engineering that combined political control with religious indoctrination. They encouraged, and occasionally forced, the Bedouin of the Nejd to forego their roamings and to settle once and for all in the new oasis communities based on strict Wahhabi rules. To highlight the parallel with Prophet Muhammad's abandonment of pagan Mecca on his Hajra, or migration, to Medina, these utopian settlements were also called Hijras. The men who settled there swore an oath to one another and adopted the name Ikhwan, brothers, that would soon instill horror all over Arabia. The Ikhwan knew little about farming and had a hard time sustaining themselves with the meager crops that could sprout from the Hishra's dry land, but they were very proficient in warfare, and, like most neophytes, were powered by infinite zeal. They cut short their robes and often painted their beards with red henna. Faithful to the bigoted Wahhabi view that considered other Muslims as infidels, the Ikhwan refused to answer greetings by those who were not fellow brothers, let alone Christians. This fanaticism turned the Ikhwan into the shock troops of al sads conquests. Moving swiftly across the Arabian Peninsula, they seized town after town in a war of expansion that lasted decades. By 1913, the predominantly Shiite Gulf Coast, where giant oil riches remained undiscovered, had fallen to al sad In 1924, after failing to capture the Jordanian capital city Amman, the Ikhwan battled their way into the town of Taif, perched atop a mountain escarpment near Mecca. The slaughter was brutal. Some 400 Taif citizens were bludgeoned by the Ikhwan, who, just as the Wahhabi raiders had in Karbala a century earlier, enjoyed slicing open pregnant women's wombs. Showing contempt for Taif's urban luxuries, the Ikhwan smashed mirrors and ripped out window frames using the wood for campfires. Mecca surrendered later in the year, after Abdulaziz promised the Meccans that the Ikhwan would not be allowed to plunder their city. By the late 1920s, Abdulaziz had secured his rule over most of the Arabian Peninsula, becoming the absolute ruler of a country as large as the United States east of the Mississippi. The Ikhwan Frankenstein ran out of room to loot and ransack. Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, and smaller Gulf sheikdoms on the New Kingdom's borders were now protected by Britain, and King Abdulaziz could not afford a major war with what was still a mighty empire on which the sun never set. He also wanted to be recognized as the legitimate custodian of Mecca and Medina by the entire Muslim world, and this meant that the Ikhwan could no longer be allowed to harass non-Wahhabi pilgrims to the holy sites. The Ikhwan, on their part, were already incensed by al sads decision to spare the unrepentant Shiites of the eastern coast, King Abdulaziz's new demand to stop the jihad against the heretics and infidels was seen in Ikhwan encampments as a blatant betrayal of God's word. In a final insult, the king began introducing devil's inventions never seen in Arabia before. The telegraph, the telephone, the radio, and the car. The Ikhwan's hijraz, fat with fresh booty no more, were boiling with discontent. Defying the king in 1927, the Ikhwan attacked British-ruled Iraq and then tried to storm the prosperous port of Kuwait, also under Britain's tutelage. Soon the Wahhabi warriors felt the pain of another devil's invention, the airplane. With King Abdulaziz's agreement, Britain's Royal Air Force flew bombing sorties against Ikhwan camps and the Hijraz. Hundreds of men, women, and children were killed, strafed from the air. In March 1929, 
the weakened Ikhwan faced al Saad's loyalist troops for a decisive battle near the wells of the Nejdi oasis of Sabala. As King Abdulaziz's sons led royal detachments, the two armies, mounted on horses and camels, galloped toward each other under the cries of Allahu Akbar. The Ikhwan were commanded by two tribal leaders of legendary authority, Faisal al Duwesh and Sultan al Bijad. Luck was on al Saad's side. In the first moments of fighting, Duaish was gravely wounded in the stomach. Demoralized, his kinsmen began a retreat that quickly turned into a rout. Minutes later, their ranks cut down by al Saad's heavy machine guns. Bijad and fellow Utebi tribesmen also abandoned the field. By the end of that year, the last pockets of the Ikhwan movement were destroyed in the Nejd. The Ikhwan's arms had been confiscated, and both Doaish and Bijad languished in jail, where they quickly died. In the gutted Hijraz, many Ikhwan families found themselves orphaned by the fighting, and deeply shocked by the sudden collapse of their world. Among the hardest hit was the small Hijra of Sajir, north of Riyadh, peopled by many survivors of the Great Battle of Sabala. One of the veterans nursing grievances there was Muhammad bin Saif al Utebi, who had fought side by side with the great chief Bijad, and who fondly remembered the legendary sheikh's final words, Never give up. Seven years after the rout at Sabala, Muhammad celebrated the birth of a son. The baby seemed to grimace a lot, and so the father decided to name him the Scowler. In Arabic, the name was Juhayman. Chapter 2 By the time Juhayman al-Utebi became old enough to start growing a beard, as every good Muslim should do, the huge country assembled by King Abdulaziz was barely recognizable. A famine-prone backwater for centuries, Saudi Arabia was suddenly thrust into global limelight and unimagined wealth. The reason? A discovery that the kingdom sat atop one quarter of the world's irreplaceable and increasingly precious commodity, oil. American explorers tapped the first oil well in eastern Saudi Arabia in 1938. Seven years later, recognizing the kingdom's strategic importance, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt dined with King Abdulaziz aboard the USS Quincy in Egypt's Great Bitter Lake, bestowing on the elderly monarch the gift of a spare wheelchair and sealing a lasting strategic alliance between the two countries. Aramco, the Arabian American Oil Company, then under complete American ownership, became the monopoly operator of the Saudi oil industry. Soon, thousands of American oil experts, construction engineers, and military men started pouring into the kingdom, building the first modern roads, power lines, and airfields. Though these western infidels were usually sheltered from Saudi eyes, living inside walled compounds, their very presence ran against the core of Wahhabi teachings and was perceived as an affront by many religious luminaries. One of the more virulent early protesters against American penetration was an up-and-coming scholar named Abdelaziz bin Baz. In a fiery fatwa that he signed in the 1940s and that earned him the admiration of surviving Ikhwan, bin Baz spelled out the same objections against Western presence in Saudi Arabia that al-Qaeda militants are voicing today. Blind since his teenage years, bin Baz was already greatly respected for his intricate knowledge of Prophet Muhammad's sayings, the Hadith, a fundamental source of Islamic law. And the Hadith, bin Baz said, extended the traditional ban on infidel presence in Mecca and Medina to the entire Arabian Peninsula. It is illicit to employ a non-Muslim servant, whether male or female, or a non-Muslim driver, or a non-Muslim worker in the Arabian Gulf, for the Prophet commanded that all Jews and Christians be expelled, and only Muslims remain, bin Baz wrote. The presence of infidels, male or female, poses a danger to Muslims, their beliefs, their morality, and their children's education. Offended by the fatwa's bluntness, King Abdulaziz, who had grown to appreciate the income provided by American oilmen, jailed Bin Baz for daring to oppose royal policy. Then the monarch impressed on the cleric that such public dissent could undermine the Islamic legitimacy of al Saud's Wahhabi state, opening the floodgates to the far worse evils of communism and secularism. Bin Baz learned the lesson. 
In a lengthy career that took him to the pinnacle of the Saudi religious establishment, he would always temper his criticism of modernization by backing the Saudi regime in its times of adversity. Saudi Arabia's founder, King Abdulaziz, died in 1953, leaving behind scores of sons who would take turns as his successors. These were precarious years. Fellow monarchies on Saudi Arabia's doorstep collapsed one after another in bloody revolutions, swept away by the nationalist fervor that followed the Arab army's humiliating defeat by the nascent Israeli state in Palestine. Egypt's king was ousted in a 1952 coup that brought the revolutionary dictator Gamal Abdel Nasser to power. Iraq's king and his family were slaughtered in 1958. Yemen's ancient monarchy collapsed in 1962. Nasser's ideas of secular Arab nationalism, which viewed Saudi Arabia as a feudal relic that should dissolve into a single pan-Arab state sharing oil riches equally among all its citizens, presented a mortal danger to al Saud. There was only one viable alternative to this pan-Arab dream, the idea of a global Islamic nation, the Ummah. King Faisal, the fruit of a marriage between King Abdulaziz and a woman descended from the great Ibn Abd al-Wahhab, became an eloquent champion of this pan-Islamic ideology. He rejected talk of unity among all Arabs, many of whom, after all, were inferior Christians, as ungodly. Wouldn't it make more sense, he argued, to seek an alliance sanctified by a shared faith and embracing all Muslims, be they Arabs or Turks, Nigerians or Malays? This stress on Islamic identity permitted Saudi Arabia to claim a global leadership role. A marginal player in Arab politics at the time, the kingdom couldn't compete with the bustling centers of modern Arab culture in Cairo, Beirut, or Baghdad. But Saudi Arabia was unquestionably the birthplace of Islam, and the only nation where Islamic law still reigned supreme. The royal family's control over Mecca and Medina... Islam's two holiest sites, allowed it to influence how the faith itself was practiced around the world. The advent of commercial air travel attracted ever-growing numbers of pilgrims to these two shrines. The Grand Mosque in Mecca underwent expensive enlargement and renovation, courtesy of the royal family's loyal servant and trusted advisor, a construction magnate named Mohammed bin Laden. Gaudy new colonnades, marble domes, and prayer halls lined with artificial stone replaced much of the ancient structure. Between 1956 and the late 1970s, the Grand Mosque expanded sixfold in size, growing to occupy 180,850 square meters, or almost 45 acres. Historic neighborhoods in the vicinity were torn down without mercy to make room for concrete hotels, public latrines, and asphalted parking lots necessary to handle the pilgrim traffic. In a sign of royal gratitude, key thoroughfares in Jeddah and Mecca were called Bin Laden Street. They carry this name even today. As part of his pan-Islamic outreach, King Faisal also invited into the kingdom thousands of members of the Muslim Brotherhood, the secretive fundamentalist organization that preached the destruction of secular Arab regimes. The Brotherhood, whose armed secret apparatus had unsuccessfully tried to assassinate Nasser, was outlawed and persecuted in Egypt and Syria. Its chief ideologue, Sayyid Qutub, still revered by Islamic radicals worldwide, had been hanged in Cairo. By contrast, Qutub's brother Muhammad was welcomed with open arms in Saudi Arabia, which awarded him and other Brotherhood exiles plum teaching jobs in the kingdom's new universities, among their students were many of Juhayman's future aides, as well as Mohammed bin Laden's young son, Osama. King Faisal's international prominence as defender of Islamic causes provided him the legitimacy to remove some of the more anachronistic Wahhabi structures at home, dragging a reluctant and mostly illiterate Saudi Arabia closer to modernity. Shunting aside the guardians of Wahhabi orthodoxy, Faisal outlawed slavery in 1962. The following year, he ignored street protests and went ahead with his plans to introduce education for women. And in a 1965 move that ended up costing him his life, Faisal created Saudi television. These first TV broadcasts sparked bloody riots in Riyadh by religious conservatives, 
who contended that the satanic innovation violated Islamic prohibitions against graven images. The king's own nephew took part in these protests and was subsequently killed in a shootout with police. Despite their private misgivings about Faisal's reforms, leading Wahhabi clerics couldn't openly challenge the king. The reason was an enormous surge in Faisal's popularity following the 1973 Israeli-Arab War. Outraged by the U.S. airlift of weapons to the Jewish state, which had seemed about to buckle under a surprise assault by Egypt and Syria, King Faisal orchestrated that year an Arab oil embargo against America and Israel's European allies. This was an immensely profitable initiative. As the price of crude soared, the kingdom's oil revenues, some $1.2 billion in 1970, shot up to $22.5 billion in 1974, and then kept climbing to nearly $100 billion a year at the end of the decade. This flood of money transformed Saudi lifestyles virtually overnight. Housing developments mushroomed in the kingdom's dusty main cities, drawing in Bedouins who had never seen a gas stove or a toilet bowl and who often moved into new apartments with their livestock. Hospitals and schools sprouted in remote towns. Cars rather than camels became the main method of transport, and countless government jobs opened up for the kingdom's proud citizens. A classified CIA intelligence assessment opined, The Saudis are flush and have few rational options to dispose of their income. Since hardly any Saudis were sufficiently qualified or disciplined for private sector employment, the already sizable infidel community had to be expanded as well. A myriad of laborers disembarked from the Third World, Muslim Pakistanis, Egyptians, and Turks, but also non-Muslim Indians, Koreans, and Filipinos. By the late 1970s, these foreigners were visible in every corner of the kingdom, accounting for a stunning half of the country's labor force and one-third of its six million inhabitants. In March 1975, King Faisal, at the zenith of his popularity, prepared to welcome a Kuwaiti delegation that arrived to pay its respects. Hidden among the Kuwaitis in Faisal's Riyadh palace that day was a nephew, the brother of the prince who had been killed following the 1965 television riots. When his turn came for a customary kiss on the monarch's nose, the nephew extracted a pistol from the folds of his robe and unloaded it in King Faisal's head. Declared deranged, the assassin was promptly beheaded. Replacing the late King Faisal on the throne was his brother, King Khaled. A simple man with little formal education, Khaled was already stricken by debilitating illnesses and, by most accounts, appeared far more interested in his camel farm than the affairs of the state. Real power for more than two decades to come dropped into the lap of another sibling, the crown prince and later king, Fahd. Chapter 3 Prosperity generated under King Faisal took a long time to reach out-of-the-way Bedouin settlements like Juhayman's former Hijra of Sajir. For the young men who lived in this jumble of mud houses, set on a dry, gravelly plain, far away from the booming oil fields, few opportunities existed outside the ancient business of herding camels and growing dates. There was one exception, however, the Saudi National Guard. A Praetorian force of the Saudi regime, the Guard existed to protect al-Sa'd from internal unrest. In the age of military coups, this meant, above all, counterbalancing the regular military. The Saudi army and air force were staffed by ambitious young officers from cosmopolitan coastal cities who often nurtured Arab nationalist and socialist ideas. The Guard, which since its early days absorbed the defeated Ikhwan, was immune to such alien thoughts. The force was infused with Islamic orthodoxy and always preferred to recruit among the conservative tribesmen of the Nejd. Juhayman enrolled at the age of 19. The guard's role as a foiler of coups meant that it had to operate outside the Ministry of Defense and the normal military chain of command. It reported directly to Prince Abdullah, who was respected by the Bedouins because of his desert upbringing and matrilineal descent from one of the mightiest tribes of the Nejd, the Shamar. Still a direct commander of the National Guard, Abdullah succeeded King Fahd in 2005 and reigns in Saudi Arabia today. 
When Juhaiman was a guardsman, service in the force, also known then as the White Army, because its men wore the traditional white Arab robes and bandoliers across the chest instead of khaki uniforms, was hardly an arduous task. While some guardsmen belonged to modern mechanized units, a large proportion of the men, including Juhaiman, collected their pay for occasional soldiering in a part-time tribal militia that cared little about military discipline. The militia units were organized based on the tribal origin of the troops, and training was haphazard when it occurred at all. Many of the guardsmen, who ranged from teenagers to white-haired elders, never bothered to show up and summon for exercises. For those willing to work the system, the guard offered avenues of rapid social advancement. The example was set by members of Juhaiman's immediate family. The brother of Juhaiman's first wife, a court poet who penned flowery Bedouin-style odes to the senior princes, made a brilliant career in the force, earning generals crossed swords on his shoulder straps. He can still be seen orating pans on Saudi TV. Juhaiman himself never showed such ambition. Raised on memories of the Ikhwan defeat at the Battle of Savala, he did not forgive al-Sa'd the indignities that had been inflicted on his kin. Like most orthodox Wahhabis, Juhaiman did not smoke, considering tobacco consumption a sin. But his disgust with the Saudi state and its laws outweighed such qualms. He supplemented his modest guard pay by dabbling in the lucrative trade of smuggling cheap cigarettes from Kuwait. Like many fellow Bedouins who learn how to handle firearms from childhood, Juhaiman was a good marksman. He also nurtured ties with numerous cousins, relatives, and friends dispersed throughout the force and other Saudi security agencies. But in his 18-year guard career, he never rose above the rank of corporal, and the most responsible assignment he ever received was driving a water truck. What Juhaiman picked up in the guard, however, was exposure to Saudi Arabia's new religious education, on the rise thanks to the oil boom and King Faisal's import of Muslim Brotherhood cadres from Egypt and Syria. At first, Juhaiman, whose guard job afforded him plenty of free time, attended lectures on Islam in Mecca with clerics like Sheikh Muhammad ibn Subail, the imam of the Grand Mosque, among his tutors. After retiring from the service in 1973, he settled in a small, whitewashed home in a poor neighborhood of Medina, where lectures by the blind cleric Bin Baz now drew enraptured crowds at the new Islamic university. By then, true to the opinions he had aired in the 1940s, Bin Baz towered as the leading critic of the dizzying pace of Saudi Arabia's modernization. The liberal ideas brought home by thousands of Saudis who returned from travel abroad new shopping malls and, albeit heavily edited, American soap operas that were now broadcast on TV, simply outraged a scholar who still insisted that the earth was flat. The rot seemed to come from above. Unlike the pious King Faisal, the country's new de facto ruler, Crown Prince Fahd, was gaining a reputation as a pro-American playboy. Following Fahd's example, slews of lesser princes, and these now numbered in the thousands, had taken to escaping Wahhabi restrictions in the French Riviera or Spain's Costa del Sol, where stories proliferated about their gambling, drinking, and whoring exploits. Bin Baz didn't shy away from raising his voice in defense of tradition. He boldly attacked the government practice of displaying royal portraits on official buildings. It is not permissible to hang pictures on a wall. Instead, it is compulsory to obliterate these pictures— Hanging a picture may lead to exalting or worshipping it, particularly if the picture is that of a king, Bin Baz ruled in one decree. Cigarettes, legally sold in the kingdom, were as illicit as pork and alcohol, he ruled in another. Barber shops were supposed to be prohibited too, Bin Baz decreed. Even clapping hands was forbidden behavior because it emulated Western ways. The cleric reserved his harshest vitriol for the budding emancipation of Saudi women. They had just begun to emerge from age-old seclusion and were appearing in the workplace, some even becoming newscasters on government-run TV. Though Bin Baz, being blind, couldn't watch TV news, he was infuriated by such lassitude. In one ruling, he lashed out at a proposal in one of the newspapers that women teachers be allowed to work in boys' elementary schools. 
This suggestion has been inspired by Satan or some of his deputies, and is pleasing to our enemies and the enemies of Islam, Bin Baz struck with his usual bluntness. This is because, when a boy reaches ten years old, he is considered an adolescent. He naturally becomes inclined toward women. Someone like him can even get married and do what men do. Bin Baz's protests about such ghastly developments seem to fall on deaf ears. While treating the cleric with deference, the Saudi government felt secure enough to ignore his advice. So, trying to force change from below, Bin Baz used his position as the dean of Medina's Islamic University to launch a new missionary movement that would reinvigorate Wahhabi devotion across the kingdom. The movement was called Dawa Salafiya al Mutasiba, a name best rendered in English as Islamic outreach that follows the way of the Prophet's companions and that is carried out with charitable goals. Supervised by Bin Baz and other senior clerics, most of whom are on the payroll of the state, this missionary network rapidly spread throughout the country. And in recruitment to the true path of God, it produced wonders of showmanship. One way of saving impressionable souls at the time was to offer poor youngsters a cheap desert weekend. For two days, participants would listen to religious lectures in the stifling heat, fed only dry, flat bread flavored with vinegar. Pray to Allah, and he will deliver, they would be urged again and again. Then, at the end of interminable sessions of prayer, a miracle from God would be arranged to reward the believers for their strength and faith. Suddenly, exhausted participants would stumble upon a surprise spread of steaming lamb, saffron rice, and sour yogurt, inexplicably laid out for them in the middle of the desert. It's Allah's gift, a teacher would proclaim. Allah was usually so thoughtful as to throw in enough ice-cold Pepsi for everyone. Coke, blacklisted in most of the Arab world at the time for selling its beverages in Israel, was not an option. Juhayman, with his desert upbringing and charismatic demeanor, proved a natural for such indoctrination trips. Soon, he rose in Dawa al-Mutasiba's hierarchy, becoming the main coordinator for the movement's outings and traveling to recruit allies across the country. At the Hajj of 1976, he was already an established authority, supervising the camp for Dawa al-Mutasiba's adepts, making a pilgrimage to the Grand Mosque. A young student, Nasser al Hosemi was introduced to Juhayman in Mecca that year. As befitted a true leader, Juhayman could only be met after lengthy preparations where the neophytes would learn about the man's greatness. When the time came, Hosemi was shepherded by Juhayman's aides into the meeting room. He immediately sensed the former corporal's magnetism. Why don't you go with us for outreach work? Juhayman asked, scrutinizing the newcomer. Hosemi, a diminutive, olive-skinned man meekly nodded in agreement, awed by the attention bestowed on him. Soon, like hundreds of fellow missionaries, he started traveling from one desert settlement to another, spreading God's word. As the new movement flourished, Bin Baz left the Islamic University of Medina and moved to the capital, Riyadh, gaining nationwide authority at the helm of the Department of Scientific Research and Guidance. This innocuous-sounding clerical body held enormous power. It was in charge of interpreting Islamic law, the only law valid in the country, and of delivering fatwas, the binding religious opinions on all facets of life in the kingdom. In Saudi Arabia, where the regime's very legitimacy is based on its Islamic credentials, Bin Baz's new position as chairman of the department carried a senior cabinet minister's rank. Every week from then on, the blind cleric would appear on TV solemnly sitting next to the king and discussing affairs of the state in an opulent palace room, a visible proof that men of the only true faith remained four square behind al Saud. In providing such a religious shield to the ruling family, Bin Baz and the other leading ulema, scholars of Islam, embodied a contradiction that keeps exploding in Saudi Arabia again and again. After all, the Wahhabi clerics never moderated the original ideology that had prompted the bands of Ikhwan to slaughter and pillage across the peninsula in the 1920s. Hatred of non-Muslims and all signs of social change was still taught in the fancy air-conditioned new Islamic universities of Riyadh and Medina, just as it had been drilled into pupils' brains in the old baked mud madrasas of the desert half a century earlier. But 
taking to heart a lesson that King Abdulaziz had imparted on Bin Baz back in the 1940s, the senior ulema made sure that theory and practice stayed apart. Their rejection of modern ways never crossed the line into open opposition to the royal family. It was fine to criticize proposed reforms, but not the established government. Despite the reports of their drinking and gambling in Europe, the Saudi royals were still seen by these ulema as the only bulwark of Islam in an increasingly secular world. Opposing the established rulers, official Wahhabi clerics taught, was a cardinal sin. Juhayman, who, unlike the ulema, didn't receive a fat government salary, was unwilling to be so forgiving. Molded by Bin Baz's teachings of what a true Islamic society should be, he couldn't understand the growing gap between Islamic theory and Saudi reality without questioning the very foundation of the regime. In Medina, he witnessed the coddling that Muslim Brotherhood exiles, who openly denounced the Egyptian and Syrian governments as infidel, received in the Saudi kingdom. But if it was religiously permissible for the Egyptians to oppose their authorities because they weren't sufficiently Muslim, why did the Ulema deny such a right to the Saudis? Wasn't it clear, Juhayman wondered, that the ubiquitous royal portraits, still displayed everywhere in spite of Bin Baz's fatwa, were a sign of un-Islamic behavior that positively veered into idolatry? The king's bearded likeness even graced the Saudi currency, the rial. By 1977, as Juhayman debated this quandary with sympathetic clerics in Medina and Riyadh, his allegiance to Bin Baz and the establishment ulema began to erode. Soon, he started to pen a series of treatises that would lead hundreds of followers to a deadly showdown in the Grand Mosque and inspire future generations of jihadis. Brimming with common-sense irony, these epistles highlighted the contradictions of the Saudi state, ridiculing its Islamic credentials at a time when, as Jahiman noted, worship of the Rial took hold of the land and imported movies and books poisoned young minds. Even the official body that enforced Islamic propriety and had long made liberals chafe, the Committee to Promote Virtue and Prevent Vice, was nothing but a sham, Juhayman argued. What is the meaning of the committee when we have cinemas, clubs, and art shows? he asked. What is the meaning of spending money on both things? Isn't that a comedy, a way of satisfying the lustful while deceiving the great sheikhs? There was simply no way to reconcile Islam's innate superiority with the surging numbers of foreigners and Saudi Arabia's shameful dependence on America and other Western nations. How is it possible to declare jihad against the states of the infidels when we have ambassadors in their countries, and they have in ours ambassadors, experts, and professors? Juhayman wondered. We should not be deceived by the ornaments. How can we propagate Islam when our professors are Christians? Is it possible to raise the flag of jihad when the banner of Christianity is flapping next to the banner of the faith of one God, Islam? He was especially upset by the insufficiently harsh treatment reserved for Saudi Shiites. In the radical Wahhabi worldview, the Shiites are apostate polytheists because they revere Ali and Hussein, the Prophet's son-in-law and grandson, in the same way Christians worship Jesus alongside God the Father. Back at the dawn of the Saudi state, the leading ulema of Riyadh issued a fatwa asking King Abdulaziz to destroy Shiite mosques and to force these heretics to adopt Sunni Wahhabi Islam on pain of expulsion. But for reasons of real politic, this draconian ruling has never been implemented. Despite pressure from the Ikhwan in the 1920s, Shiite clergy were allowed to operate on the country's Gulf Coast, and Saudi authorities while discriminating against the Shiites, considered them fellow Muslims. This country calls itself the state of one God, Juhayman scoffed. But then, it accepts the Shiites to be called Muslims, and fights those who disagree with this, and opposes those who combat the heretical worshippers of Ali and Hussein. As Juhayman attracted a following of disaffected young students, his vociferous views started to draw unwelcome attention. Sometime in 1977, the question of Juhayman appeared on the agenda of a large meeting of senior clerics in Medina. Juhayman himself was not present at the encounter, held in a large reception room with bare walls, but his opinions were defended by supportive scholars such as Makbil al-Wadi, a Yemeni preacher who would later become a spiritual guide of al-Qaeda fighters in his homeland. 
On the opposing side were Bin Baz's representative in the city and several Islamic judges and professors from the Islamic University. The meeting, watered by multiple cups of sweet tea and fruit juice, proved acrimonious. Whenever establishment clerics chastised Juhayman's invective, defenders pointed out that the retired National Guard corporal simply repeated the teachings of revered Wahhabi scholars and applied them to current Saudi conditions. What they have said, Juhayman says, argued Wadi. After all, hatred of infidels and Shiites and the prohibition of images were all to be found right there in the holy books. One just had to read the fatwas of Bin Baz himself. Finally, one of the senior clerics agreed that, theologically, there was little fault with Juhayman's thought. The issue was simple common sense at the time of rising communist threat. Communism would destroy Islam, and al-Sad are much better than the rest, he explained. At the end of the meeting, another of the official clerics issued a warning for Juhayman. The state, he said, has opened its eyes, and it is watching you. For Juhayman and his hardcore allies, this exchange marked a formal break with the official guardians of Islam. The learned ulema, he concluded, had betrayed the faith, siding for reasons of political expediency with a regime they clearly knew to be violating Islamic rules. Those who really know the Sunnah, Prophet Muhammad's teachings and actions, are few, and one of them is bin Baz, Juhayman wrote but he is now just an administrative employee. The al-Sad take from him only what suits them. If he disagrees with them, they will have no problem in disagreeing with what he says. Soon Juhayman openly crossed the line into sedition, proclaiming Saudi Arabia's monarchy itself to be illicit. You should know that a ruler and leader of Muslims should satisfy three conditions. Be a Muslim, be a member of Prophet Muhammad's tribe of al Quraysh, and be a man who applies the religion. Jehaiman wrote, pointing out that al-Sad, not being of Quraysh descent, did not qualify in at least two counts. Rulers of other Muslim lands were equally illegitimate, Jehaiman added, challenging the respected ulema to oppose these usurpers. Have you condemned evildoers in public? Such a testimony has to be obvious and not hidden in your hearts. Have you told the presidents, emirs, ministers, and kings that they contradict the faith? Have you warned the people, as Prophet Muhammad has warned, not to work as policemen, tax collectors, and servants for those who befriend the evildoers? Then, with unnerving foresight, Juhayman pondered his own fate. His father and other Ikhwan, he recalled, had been labeled Karijites by al Saud. The term, which means a deviant from religion, was originally used to name the radical Karijite sect whose adepts assassinated Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law Ali in the year 661. In modern Saudi Arabia, Juhayman noted, a scholar of Islam had three options, to agree with al-Sad, to keep silent, or to oppose the regime. He himself had no intention of taking the first two options, Juhayman wrote, and then concluded, if you disagree with them, they will kill you, and then they will call you a Karijite. 